mic check. Feels good. Feels good. Feels good. Come on. Yeah, baby. Welcome. To connecting the purple dust. <laughs> every hole you open is closed. I've played that before. Mm -hmm. They're listening. They're listening. Every hole you open up is closing now. I just started following uh, dots, connected to purple dots. He's very well researched. I like him a lot. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, forget everything you've seen on television and in the movies. There's not going to be any last minute surprise witnesses. Nobody's going to break down on the stand with a tearful confession. You're going to be presented simple fact. Before we begin, I wanted to state that prior to April 21st, 2016, no one had any problems, issues, or concerns with Kirk Anthony Johnson. There was nothing written about him, publicized, talked about, rumored, or otherwise reported in the media. April 21st, 2016. As reported by Sergeant J. Brunig. When Detective Sergeant Meir arrived on the scene, he asked that I join him and other law enforcement officers in doing a protective sweep of the property. The purpose of this is to find out if anyone else is on the property and to ensure that the scene is safe. An adult male by the name of Kirk accompanied us during the protective sweep. Kirk is a high-level staffer who was close to Nelson and had keys for the property. While we were on the second floor of the building during the protective sweep, we noticed a black colored glove and a black colored garment, which appeared to be a jacket lying in the hallway. Kirk was asked if that seemed normal. Kirk replied it was not normal and for that reason he did not touch it. I did not observe anyone or anything suspicious during the rest of the protective sweep of the interior of the building. Detective Sergeant Mir and I did a protective sweep of the area around the outside of the building. I did not observe anything suspicious. As recorded and reported by Deputy James Harvath. I proceeded to activate my digital recorder and spoke to Kirk about the incident. I was informed that Kirk is an employee of Prince's and handled most of his daily affairs. The following is a summary of our conversation. Kirk told me about recently having to make an airplane perform an emergency landing due to Prince blacking out in flight. Kirk said, Prince was rushed to the local hospital but refused to submit to a blood test while he was there to find out what was wrong. Kirk said he told Prince that he needed to take him to the doctor when they got home so they could get checked out. Kirk said he took Prince to a doctor's appointment at North Memorial Clinic at 1700 hours yesterday. 4-20-2016. Kirk said he could tell Prince was going through withdrawal symptoms as he was driving him home from the doctor. Kirk believed the withdrawal symptoms were from prescription medication, but did not know what prescriptions Prince was taking. Kirk also did not know how long Prince had been using prescription drugs but suspected it had been a long time. Kirk specifically told me that Prince refused to provide a blood test at the hospital because he did not want people to know about his use of prescription medication. Kirk told me the only thing Prince complained about 
on the ride back home from the doctor's office was that he was suffering from anxiety and dehydration. Please see full statement for further information. Note, there is a considerable amount of background noise during our conversation and at times it is hard to hear Kirk. On 4-21-2016, at 11.50 hours or 11.50 a.m. Central Standard Time, I met with Prince's bodyguard, Kirk Anthony Johnson, who agreed to provide a statement. Kirk said he first met Prince in 1984 as a dancer in Purple Rain. Kirk said from 1989 to 1992, he was a band member from 1992 to 1996, he assisted with drums and producing. From 1997 to 2000, Kirk was again a drummer in Prince's band. Kirk said he left for a short time to pursue his career as a health and fitness instructor from 2000 to 2009. From 2009 to present, he was hired as Prince's building, property, and security manager. Kirk said Prince's manager was Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, who had taken another job in California a year ago and had not yet been replaced. Kirk said the only other person other than himself who frequent Paisley Park on a daily basis were Marone Berkshire, Prince's assistant, and Ray Roberts, Raymond Russell Roberts, Prince's chef. I asked Kirk about Prince's medical history. Kirk said he did not know all of Prince's health background, but stated he started to figure it out when he was flying back from Atlanta that he, Prince, passed out unconscious and it scared me so. Kirk said Prince had a concert in Atlanta on Thursday, April 14th, 2016. Kirk said they flew down there for the concert and headed back right after. Kirk said Prince had one of his best concerts. The concert ended around 23.30 hours or 11.30 p.m. Kirk said he, Prince, and Judith Hill, a singer, boarded the plane and headed back to Minnesota. Kirk said he was asleep when Judith woke him up and told him, Kirk, something, something's wrong with Prince. Kirk said he found Prince was unconscious. Kirk said he tried to wake Prince up but couldn't and requested the plane make an emergency landing. The plane landed at the Quad City International Airport in Moline, Illinois. Kirk said Prince went to the hospital in Moline, Illinois, and they gave him something to take him out of the unconsciousness. Kirk told me during the interview with the doctor, Prince admitted he took one to two pain pills, which Kirk thought were called naloxone. Naloxone is sold under the brand name Narcan, which the paramedics use to treat Prince. I believe Kirk was confused when he told me Prince took naloxone. Kirk said he did not know if Prince had a prescription and did not have any other information regarding where Prince was obtaining the pain medication. This is lie number one. Kirk told me the doctor who was in the lobby when we arrived was actually Kirk's doctor, Dr. Mike Schulenberg, and that Kirk contacted Dr. Schulenberg for Prince last week because Kirk was concerned about Prince's health after the incident on the plane. Kirk said Prince continued to complain about being dehydrated and had tingling in his arms so Kirk urged Prince to see a doctor. Kirk said a week before the emergency plane landing, Prince was seen by Dr. Schulenberg. 
and given fluids because he wasn't feeling good. Kirk said Prince was complaining about the tingling in his arms and being dehydrated and needing fluids. Kirk said he took Prince to the 212 Ridgeview Emergency Center a few years ago when Prince was complaining that he was really dehydrated and needed fluids. Kirk said he believed Prince was fine after that. Kirk told me that recently Prince was looking a little frail, but that he always kinda goes up and down. Kirk said Prince was a very good eater, that he would normally eat lunch and dinner. He was a vegetarian who would sometimes eat eggs and fish. Kirk said Prince was not someone to eat breakfast, so there would be no reason for the cook to come to Paisley Park this early. Kirk said Prince would occasionally drink alcohol, usually wine, but that Prince was not a big drinker. Kirk explained that Prince was a night guy who was very private, even from Kirk. Kirk said Prince would be sending texts or emails at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I later asked Kirk about Prince having a cell phone because of the phrase text or email. Kirk denied Prince owned a cell phone. This is lie number two. Kirk said that Prince communicated by email and landline phone numbers only. The phone in the bedroom and the kitchen were the numbers Kirk would call when he needed to talk to Prince. Kirk explained how Prince would have an assistant who would handle Prince's affairs so Prince didn't need to have a cell phone. I was told Prince would use whoever's phone he was with if he wanted to talk with someone. Kirk continued to state that during the evening of the emergency plane landing, he believed Prince stayed at the hospital until around 0900 or 9 a.m. the following morning of Friday, April 15, 2016, because they were waiting for another jet to pick them up. Kirk said he did not see Prince every day. It was only when Prince needed something. Kirk said when they landed in Minnesota, Prince and Judith Hill drove off in one vehicle and Kirk left in another. Kirk said the next day, Saturday, April 16, 2016, Prince hosted a dance party with approximately 250 to 300 people because Prince wanted everyone to know that he was all right. Kirk said Prince seemed fine during the party and did not see anything out of the ordinary. Kirk said Prince did not perform, but that was not unusual for a dance party. Kirk told me he did not see Prince on Sunday, April 17, 2016. Kirk did not think he saw Prince again until Tuesday evening, April 19, 2016, around 2000 to 2030 hours or 8 to 8.30 p.m. When they had a meeting with Prince, Larry Graham, Marone Bacur, and Kirk. Kirk said Prince had canceled shows on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of that week. April 18 through the 22nd of 2016. Because of what happened in Atlanta, they were trying to urge Prince to take a break. Kirk said Prince was the one who wanted the help and urged Prince to get a physical exam by a doctor. That was why Kirk made the appointment with Dr. Schulenberg. According to Kirk, on Wednesday, April 20th, 2016, the day after the meeting, they reached out to Recovery Without Walls to get an evaluation. The doctor, Howard Kornfeld, was unable to meet with Prince, so Howard was sending out his son, Andrew Kornfeld. Kirk said Prince was a very private person and hid it well. Kirk said no one would talk about it and believed people were scared to talk about it. Kirk told me that he did not know where Prince was obtaining the narcotic medications. Kirk told me that Prince never asked Kirk to get a prescription for him. I would later find out this information contradicts the statement 
provided by Dr. Schulenberg when Dr. Schulenberg admitted to Detective Chris Nelson that he gave a prescription for Percocet to Prince but put the prescription in Kirk Johnson's name at Kirk's request because Prince did not want to be tied to the narcotic prescription. Lie number three. Kirk told me he did not know Prince was addicted to pain medications, but that it was all making sense after watching Prince's change in behavior and his moods. Kirk told me he knew Prince had hip pain after having surgery on his left hip several years ago. Kirk said Prince did not have a regular doctor and that is why Kirk contacted his doctor, Dr. Schulenberg, for help. Kirk said he originally contacted Dr. Schulenberg approximately a week before the Atlanta concerts and emergency landing. Kirk said Dr. Schulenberg initially came to Paisley Park and then instructed Prince to go to the clinic to get fluids. Kirk said on Wednesday, April 20th, 2016, Prince had his second appointment with Dr. Schulenberg. Kirk picked up Prince around 1645, otherwise known as 445 p.m., and they responded to North Memorial for an appointment with Dr. Schulenberg at 1700 hours, otherwise known as 5 p.m. Kirk said the doctor took blood and urine samples along with Prince's vitals. Kirk told me that Dr. Schulenberg coincidentally was at Paisley Park on this day to talk with Prince about the test results. The doctor told Kirk there was evidence that Prince was on something. During the appointment on April 20th, 2016, Prince told the doctor that he was taking Tylenol. But according to Kirk, Prince told Dr. Schulenberg that he, Prince, did not know what kind. Kirk told me after the appointment at North Memorial on Wednesday, April 20th, 2016, they stopped at the Walgreens on Highway 101 and Highway 7 around 1900 hours to fill a prescription that Dr. gave Prince to calm and help the jitters. Kirk said Prince took one of the pills and said it wasn't working. Kirk told me Prince did not want to take the rest of the pills because Prince said it wasn't helping. Kirk initially said he thought he threw the pills away, but then recalled that he thought he kept the prescription pills in case Prince wanted to take them in the future. Kirk believed the prescription pills were at his house. Kirk told me there were three prescriptions, but he could not recall what they were. Kirk later gave consent for his aunt, Charlene Hayes, to retrieve the prescription pills issued to Prince and released them to me. Kirk said after they filled the prescription, he dropped Prince off at Paisley Park around 1945 to 2000 hours, otherwise known as 745 to 8 p.m. And that was the last time he talked to Prince Nelson. Kirk said the clothes Prince was found wearing along with the jacket and gloves on the floor upstairs were the same clothing Prince was wearing when Kirk dropped Prince off after the doctor's appointment. Kirk told me Prince wanted to get help. Kirk said it. Piss me off. How did he hide this so well? Kirk said again that Prince was very private. The meeting planned for today, April 21st, 2016, was to meet with Andrew Kornfeld from Recovery Without Walls. Kirk said something didn't feel right this morning. Kirk said he tried calling Prince's room and the kitchen along with sending an email, and Prince never responded. Kirk said there was no security system. Kirk said at one point there was but that Prince was very self-conscious about being watched and shut it off. There are surveillance cameras and keypads surrounding the property. However, they were not operational. Kirk told me the gate has a remote like a garage door opener and there was no way to track people coming in and out. Kirk said other than himself, Prince's closest people in his circle lately 
were Marone Bacur, Phaedra Lampkins, Larry Graham, Tyka Nelson, and Joshua and Hannah Welton. Kirk said Andrew Cornfell and Prince never met. Kirk told me Prince was the one who wanted help and that is why they got Andrew on a plane right away to come out and assess Prince. Kirk said Andrew had flown in this morning and they met him at the hotel and brought him out to Paisley Park to meet Prince. This information correlates with records at Minneapolis International Airport. I contacted an agent with the Department of Homeland Security who was able to confirm that Andrew Kornfeld flew into Minneapolis on April 21, 2016 on Delta Flight 0677 originating from San Francisco, California. The flight departed San Francisco at 019 hours, otherwise known as 1219 AM, and arrived at MSP Minneapolis at 0553, otherwise known as 553 AM on April 21st, 2016. According to the agent, this was the first trip Andrew Cornfield made to Minnesota in over a year, according to the flight records. My interview with Kirk Johnson continued to get interrupted, so I asked if we could meet again to get more specifics. Kirk said that would be fine. We ended the interview at that time and Kirk asked if he could stay on property as he did not want to leave. The Sheriff's Office Administration allowed Kirk and his family to stay on property. All right, so as we can read, see, and hear, there are numerous lies being told in the voluntary statement by one Kirk Anthony Johnson on 4-21-2016. I've opted to depart from the syllabus today. Ms. Chapin. Can you tell us what the Fifth Amendment is? The Fifth Amendment? Um, right, it um, assures your right to protection from self-incrimination. Are you asking me? No, that, that's my answer. And it's a correct one. When clients talk to the police, they think clarifying or being helpful can aid in their case. They're wrong. Whatever you say to the police can and will be misconstrued to support the prosecution. So when in doubt, shut your mouth. Your mouth shut, never tell her the plan. All right, so as we can read, see, and hear, there are numerous lies being told in the voluntary statement by one Kirk. Anthony Johnson on 4-21-2016. Thereafter, Kirk Johnson is summoned to a deposition in which he pleads the fifth or what is known as the Fifth Amendment to darn near every question that is asked. Now, I know the lies, the Fifth Amendment, just exactly what is Kirk doing and what is he hiding? However, in law, this is called when you omit details, when you refuse to put in all of the details, you can lie by including one detail which may happen to be true. You can tell the truth and miss all the details around the truth and you are lying by omission. You're lying by omission. What is lying by omission? Lying by omission is a form of deception where someone intentionally withholds important information that would change the perception or understanding of a situation. So what does lying by omission mean? Is lying by omission lying? 
it's a tricky form of lying because the person doesn't say anything false but leaves out the truth. For example, if a friend asks if you've seen a movie and doesn't mention that you watched it with someone they don't like, you're lying by omission. It is important to note that lying by omission can, I say again, can be just as damaging as lying directly. It can cause the breakdown in trust and damage relationships. <clears throat> Recognizing <laughs> this type of deception and confronting it is crucial for maintaining honesty and transparency in our interactions. Yeah, we all know people like this, don't we? <clears throat> I'd now like to call to your attention the voluntary statement of Manuela Testolini. Manuela told us Kirk told her that the night before Prince died, Prince told him, I can't kick this, I need a drink, which Kirk replied something similar to, Prince, you can't, I cleared out the studio. Manuela implied Kirk cleaned out everything in an attempt to help Prince get over his addiction. Manuela told us Kirk said, there was something in Prince's travel bag in the aspirin bottle, but that Kirk had checked the bag while he was cleaning up and didn't see it. According to Manuela, Kirk told her that he did not believe there was anything left for Prince to get and that Kirk cleaned out Paisley Park. Now just how could that be? Kirk cleaning everything out of Paisley Park that Prince could get his hands on that would feed his addiction if the police and investigators found a hundred plus Watson 853s along with the inventory of additional pills that is described in the Carver County Sheriff's investigation file. Next up is a telephone conversation between Theo London and Detective Chris Wagner. I'm sorry, Theo, was Kirk there at that time too, or were you in the... He was there. Okay, yeah, so... he was there at that time. Yep. Um, and he actually uh, fired Kirk and then brought him back. Uh, I, I knew that was his intention because he had fired Kirk several times in the past and brought him back, so it was just another... Uh, moment when he wanted to fire him and bring him back uh you know he brought him back uh after firing him but um i think that he just wanted to he wanted new energy he wanted some because he would complain about kirk and uh him not doing the job and um and i knew then i said okay here we go <laughs> he's gonna fire kirk and have me to do this and i can't do everything <laughs> you know i was yeah, um, but he said to me once, we were, it was Kirk and I uh, in his office, and we were talking about something, and um, he, I guess we got on family, and he said, uh, do you think um, Ida would sue me? And I said, Ida, no, she wouldn't sue you. And he said, okay, well, do you think Taika would sue me? And I said, Taika, no, she wouldn't sue you. And he just looked at Kurt, and then he just started laughing, and he said, yeah, okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and so Kurt told me later that Taika had sued him once or tried to or something like that. So I found that to be really interesting because that's his sister. Right. What would she sue him for? Yeah. Huh. yeah, right, exactly. So I don't, I don't know what that was, that was about, but... Um... So many questions about Prince's last days, and, you know... Kirk has a vault right here. It's never going to be unlocked. Is that because Prince was so private, you don't want to... I, res I respect him and, you know, what his privacy is. Keep your mouth shut, never tell other play. So as you can all see here, there just isn't enough information to consider or support Kirk Johnson is doing anything wrong or 
pursue him as a murderer. What we do see and what we can clearly understand is that there's lies of omission. But what we must ask ourselves are these lies of omission to protect Kirk Johnson? Are the lies of omission to protect Dr. Schulenberg? Or are the lies of omission to protect Prince himself? Thank you for watching Connecting the Purple Dots.